Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast. My name is Joshua Gibson. I am your host. And one thing that surprised me today, normally we use Zoom to record, but we're using Zencaster and there was a 3 two, one countdown. And uh, normally I'm, I'm kind of a, a straight to the point kind of guy. I hit, I hit record when we start going. Um, I was slightly thrown off, but, <laughs> but I think I, I'm starting to find a find my rhythm and as always i have kind of a cheesy intro for the show but i think the guest we have on today will solidify the uh, greatness of it and, and how interesting it will be so we have eric trexler on really well known for his work with stronger by science and you know all the other stuff he does to be honest which is almost uh, a lot to keep track of but eric before we get into your background and, and a lot of the work that you're doing you know, how, how's your day been so far? What have you been up to? Um, fill yeah, us in on that. So far, so good. Um, yeah, I pretty much, I have a new morning routine. I wake up, make my coffee. I live near a park, which is really fortunate. I uh, take a stroll over there, uh, do a little reading, uh, just leisurely reading. Right now, the topic of reading is Buddhism. I'm stoked about it, mm -hmm. very into it. <laughs> but yeah, I just sit by the pond, read a book, uh, have some coffee, and then I pulled myself back to the computer and now I'm here. Yeah. As someone who is in this space where, you know, your work can kind of consume you uh, 24 seven, given the, the kind of the, uh, just what it is, you know, people all over the world, um, having different avenues of, of, of work and income. How do you manage to balance all of those things so that you do have time to, you know, go for a walk, read, uh, stay grounded, all of that stuff? Well, uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, especially being self-employed, uh, it's very easy to get into a mindset where it's just hard to justify taking a moment to yourself and taking a moment to relax and, and kind of, uh, and just chill and kind of turn your brain off for a minute. But, uh, you know, I, I think the more you do it, the more you get from it. Um, and, and of course, it, it's a luxury. So like some people, uh, especially early in their career, it, they probably do have to work a lot more than they'd like. Um, and, you know, I still work a ton. But, you know, for something like a, a morning routine that's going to set up your day on the right foot, I, I just think you get so much more out of it than if you skipped it. Um, you know, so I mentioned I'm reading about Buddhism a lot currently. And uh, I, I saw a funny quote that was like, yeah, you need to be meditating uh, 20 minutes a day. Unless you're too busy, then you need to meditate 40 minutes a day. <laughs> you know, so it's like the the more you, um, the more likely you are to skip it, the more you probably need it, if that makes sense. So I, I've been, tr been trying to be very mindful of having a good morning routine and having a good pre-bed routine. And that's a good way to bookend my day. And what I find is even though I'm, you know, I might think I'm losing an hour of my morning by doing something like this. I'm setting myself up for a much more productive day. And so you lose an hour, but you gain so much efficiency from starting your day on the right trajectory. So that, that would be my advice to people would be if you think you're too busy to have a good morning routine to set up an efficient day, then you probably need it more than you think. Mm. Yeah, I actually made that I made a similar point to someone the other day. It seems like every person I talk to, and, and given the natural variation of, of what people do for work, for uh, whatever they, they choose to do in their free time, it seems like everyone is busy. Like, uh, you know, that's kind of like a common trope. Ask someone how they're doing. I've been really busy. And I just feel like everyone everywhere can't be busy all of the time. Uh, and, and I think it almost circles back to your point of efficiency. It's like, okay, are they busy because they're doing something or is it busy because they just have like this background noise that keeps them from feeling like they're kind of relaxed entirely or um, fully engrossed in something or removed from the other things that are consuming them. And I think that comes back to one, compartmentalizing those things, creating routines that allow for more efficient flow of work and, and uh, release from work. And it's interesting, you, you talk about getting into Buddhism. I think that's kind of the... Uh, poster child for one figuring out how to manage your day manage stress manage um, being a person living on this planet uh, but I, I'd be more interested in hearing how you got to that point where you're reading Buddhist writings 
Well, uh, I don't know. It, it's hard to say. I think uh, one of the things that got me there was, uh, you know, with, with COVID and being uh, pretty isolated for a while and not being able to train the way I like to uh, due to the gym environment and things like that. I think during COVID isolation, it, it made me kind of look inward uh, more toward arranging how I view things. And like, for example, um, in, in Buddhism, there's the concept of dukkha, which uh, loosely translates to suffering, but it's a really foundational component. And the idea is that we've got this suffering all over the place, all throughout our lives. And suffering is a strong way to phrase it, uh, which it's a loose translation. But the idea is, you know, anytime there's that thing you want and cannot currently have, that's that's its own small form of suffering. Uh, now, am I? This relates specifically to training, but I was unable to go to my gym and train the way I want to train. It sounds a bit uh, overly emotional to say I'm suffering in that in that position, but uh, but but there is some level of discomfort there. There there's that level of yearning that brings you negative emotion. And, and so exploring some of those things kind of brought me to it and thinking, well, how do I deal with that in a constructive way? You know, how, how do I arrange my day in a way that brings more happiness? And especially, you know, one of the people I really admire in my line of work, I actually am fortunate enough to work with, and it's Eric Helms. And he, I've always been blown away by his mindset, the, the way he's able to be critical but positive uh you know it, it's always been really impressive to me and in my line of work of criticizing studies and, and looking you know really deep into this work and finding faults and flaws i found that uh aside from all the isolation stuff it, it was really easy to fall into a really negative mindset and i was like how does helms maintain his ability to be a sharp mind and very critical and very nuanced without being negative in the process. It's very easy to lump those things together and feel like you're just taking swings at people's work all day and saying they don't know anything, they're full of, you know, whatever. So I was always really impressed by that. And uh, I think I am kind of gravitating more toward his perspective toward life, uh, just kind of indirectly as I get into some of these Buddhist uh, topics. And I don't know if he's even that into them, but the way that he engages with his work uh it certainly would seem so from the outside i've never actually talked to him about it but but yeah it's been a you know an interesting way of getting into like how do i do this stuff and be sharp and critical and point out faults in work without being a miserable bastard <laughs> and so that that's uh one of the things i've been trying to trying to work on you know yeah, that's that's an incredible answer. I actually have Eric Helms uh, scheduled in for Thursday, and I'll make sure I mention this to him and, and pick his brain a little bit on how he's developed such a mindset. Uh, if it's kind of or, an organic thing, or if it's something he's worked towards, which you know, it's probably a little bit of both. But um, yeah, I think that's a actually a really interesting way to start a, a podcast, specifically one about supplements, which is what I would think to be your line of expertise, given um, your educational background. You you got a bachelor's from OSU in, in exercise science, and then you went to uh, Chapel Hill, and you got your master's and PhD. Now, before we get into how supplements play into strength and power sports, Let's talk a little bit more about your education. Uh, so what was that process like? You know, what did you kind of study uh, along that trajectory? And then what was your uh, your dissertation about? Yeah, so uh, like you said, I started out at, uh, at Ohio State and uh, grew up in Ohio. I was a wrestler and a football player. Wrestling got me just obsessed with training and nutrition. I, I was really intrigued by with wrestling, the, the focus on weight classes, and it, it's a very physically demanding sport. So it's very easy to see how nutritional inputs would impact your day-to-day -day training, impact your ability to make weight easily. Uh, so yeah, I just fell in love with it. And, and I remember um, talking with a, a really great coach of mine at the time, he and I would, would train together. Um, you know, the team would be doing the workout and we'd kind of go do our own thing and, and really push it. And 
it, it was awesome. I just kind of developed this love for training and nutrition. I was talking to this coach and he was like, dude, you just got to do this forever. Like do it for a living because you're, you're really into it. And if you do anything else, you're probably going to be, you're, you're probably going to regret it. You're going to miss it. And so, uh, I ended up doing that. So I went to Ohio state, studied exercise science, got involved with, um, with some research there in, uh, in, you know, loosely related to sports nutrition. And, you know, at the time I I'd planned to be a physical therapist that that was kind of my close enough to my dream job, you know, where it's like, oh, I want to do the performance and body comp stuff, but physical therapy is close enough. And it's a very conventional route where, you know, it's a very clear pathway built in and it's, a really terrific occupation. It's it's a, a truly, um, you know, if, if I ended up pursuing that route, I'm, I'm certain that I'd be quite happy with it. But when I did the research experience, I just fell in love with the research process itself, uh, you know, in, in reading and critiquing and interpreting research and conducting research. So I kind of knew if I go the physical therapy route, it's just not the right one for me. You know, it's a great job, but it's not it's not the one for me. And so then I changed course and said, I'm going to go do a master's and a PhD. Uh, so I did those at UNC Chapel Hill. And when I was at UNC, we did a lot of research. Uh, you know, we had a few different lines of research going. We were a very, very active lab. We were working around the clock, you know, 300 and probably 58 days out of the year. Uh, it, was, it was a hellish pace, but we got a lot done. Uh, but during that time, we studied you know, body composition, uh, different types of exercise interventions, but we, we did a lot of supplement research along the way. And I mean, we studied, you name it, uh, creatine, caffeine, protein, carbohydrate supplements, uh, a whole bunch of specialized supplements, pomegranate extract, citrulline, beetroot juice. I mean, we, we studied it all, uh, which was awesome. But my, my master's thesis was on creatine and caffeine and my dissertation was on citrulline malate and beetroot juice, uh, which are nitric oxide boosters. And so you, you can kind of see, like, I remember when I was a wrestler in high school, I started being so interested in pre-workout supplements. Uh, who, who wouldn't be? That was when they were in their heyday. And, uh, you know, there are all these different ingredients. And, you would, you know, every young kid in the lifting became, you know, like... Uh, with, with wine, there's like the sommeliers who just kind of take a whiff and they can tell you what year, what region, and whether or not it was a good harvest. Uh, you know, we, we were that for pre-workout supplements. You know, with each one, you're like, ooh, that's going to get you really amped up, but it really tapers off quickly. And yeah, we we, we were just so into it. And uh, so, yeah, it was really funny to be able to pursue those things and you look at the, the biggest pieces of research, you know, that, that were, you know, your thesis dissertation and it's, it's the handbook to a pre-workout creatine, caffeine, uh, nitric oxide. So, so yeah, that was the, that was the journey. Yeah. And given all of the time you spent studying different supplements, which, you know, seemed like it kind of went from A to Z, were there any really big takeaways, any kind of overarching points that you found um, you know, given kind of the, 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 the size of the effect that most supplements would have or the, the changes in performance or um, how distinct the differences would be between supplements, anything that kind of sticks out? I would say one of the things that sticks out is uh, developing an understanding for how small the effects are from dietary supplements, uh, which doesn't mean that they're useless. It, you know, it's hard to convey that to people who want to really uh, dichotomous answer. Either they're the solution or they are worthless. And the answer is probably in the middle. It's something that can be uh, somewhat helpful, but not something that's going to change your life, you know? So even for the best of the best, even for the creatines of the supplement world, we're talking about small effects. And, you know, it's important not to lose, uh, lose sight of that. Another thing that really uh, stood out to me was the specificity with which we have to study dietary supplements and the specificity with which we can actually utilize them effectively. So getting into research. So as a lifter, you've got a way that you lift, right? And it it's very much suited to your goals as a lifter, whether it's for body composition, performance, whatever. So the way you train is 
uh, effectively stable. You might have a few different things you try here and there, but the general approach to training is pretty much stable. Uh, When it comes to designing a study for a supplement, you have to say, for what type of exercise might this be efficacious? Mm -hmm. And uh, what what you find as you become more into this world of critiquing and interpreting studies on dietary supplements is... Uh, You can't just look at a study and say it worked or it didn't. You have to look into how they were training, what was being tested here, and think through, is there any reason that the supplement should have impacted this type of testing? What you find is if you want to evaluate the ergogenic effect of an ingredient, you have to make sure you're designing your tests or your training bouts in a way that's going to really utilize this ingredient effectively. And so that's where you get into situations where a lifter might look at a supplement like beta alanine and say, does it work? Should a lifter take it? And the answer is some lifters ought to consider it. And some lifters, it's just not going to do a damn thing. And it comes down to how you're training. So so that specificity, you, you develop an appreciation for it, frankly, from looking at failed studies. When a study's trying to identify an ergogenic effect and they don't, and you say, interesting, when the protocol is this long, it seems to work. And when it's that long, it doesn't. So so that extra layer of nuance really jumped out to me as a researcher because there's no second tries. You know, there's no second chances. When you're when you're designing a trial to investigate the uh, the ergogenic effect of something, you got it, you gotta get it right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it sounds like you chose again four of the major supplements that we see. Uh, consumed or on the market today. And we we did a show previously on caffeine, which is on the Weightlifting House podcast. So for people interested, they can go check that out. It's like an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half, literally just kind of deep diving as much as you can on a podcast about the supplement. Um, but to touch base about that again quickly, I don't remember exactly when we recorded that, probably a year, year and a half ago, I would imagine. Has there been much research coming out looking at different effects of caffeine in different contexts or anything kind of new that we can add as some sort of addendum to uh, what we know about caffeine or knew about caffeine? Or is it like a relatively stable base of knowledge that we've developed and and a relatively stable understanding of what it does and what it doesn't do? No, the, the caffeine world is ever changing, uh, and it's it's an exciting time in the caffeine world. Um, I, I have a I'm, I'm a co-author of a research review called Mass M A S S, and it's it's a monthly research review. We we look at all the interesting stuff going on in strength and physique sport, getting stronger, you know, getting bigger, losing fat, all that stuff. But I've covered a few caffeine papers recently because. Uh, Things are changing. So one of the areas where we saw something really interesting recently was with uh, genetics, right? So so there, there's the CYP1A2 gene and there's the Adora2A gene. And the CYP1A2 uh, gene, that one codes for uh, a very important enzyme that's involved in breaking down caffeine. And uh, your gene for that or the alleles you get for that particular gene very clearly have an impact on how rapidly you metabolize caffeine. And so uh, intuitively, people thought, might this explain why some people have great responses to caffeine and some people don't? And the initial studies on the topic were uh, were saying, yeah, this this seems to be fairly predictive. You know, that the fast metabolizers seem to have a great response to caffeine. The slow metabolizers do not. Uh, and I was actually writing a textbook chapter about caffeine in like 2014, I think. Uh, and I wanted to get onto this topic and there was just no data to go with. There was like one study related to performance. There was one study related to uh, cardiovascular disease risk over time. And there was one related to bone loss uh, and bone density. There's just nothing relevant to go with. Well, these studies have continued to come out. The first few said, yes, you know, CYP1A2 genotype is an important predictor of your responses to caffeine. Well, we've gotten more studies come out in the last, uh, you know, what is that, seven years, and it doesn't seem to be as clean of a story as we thought. 
so the more that comes out, this genotype doesn't seem to explain all that much. Uh, and it looks like whether you're a slow or a fast metabolizer, you are likely to have an ergogenic effect. Now, how does that relate to the bone loss stuff, the cardiovascular stuff? They haven't really followed up with a ton of research in that area. All I can say is in the performance area, there have been quite a few follow-up studies and it doesn't seem to be as impactful as we once thought. Uh, the same thing goes for the, the Adora 2A gene, which codes for the adenosine receptor, which is, you know, basically caffeine works primarily as an antagonist of that adenosine receptor. So anything that affects the receptor intuitively might impact the ergogenic effect uh, of caffeine. But again, we're, we're seeing as more research comes out, the first study or two looked like, oh, wow, this is pretty important, but there's far less research on this gene than the CYP gene. Mm -hmm. But with the Adora 2A stuff, again, we're starting to, it's starting to look like regardless of your genotype, you can still have an ergogenic effect there. So the gene stuff seemed flashy and interesting and cool, but more recent research is kind of pushing me in the other direction and, and, and making me question that. One other, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering, well, if that's the case, you know, what's the, what, so what's, what does that tell us, right? If these genes aren't incredibly involved in creating some sort of uh, performance change or, or, or ergogenic effect, like, what does that mean? Well, it means that, uh, you know, you, you probably don't have to get uh, 23 and me to figure out if you should <laughs> be uh, using caffeine or not, uh, at least for performance purposes. Uh, so we're, we're identifying ergogenic effects uh, for people with all different genotypes uh, related to these two genes. So uh, that was a, a big concern a lot of people had was if, if I'm a slow metabolizer, am I screwed? Do I need to figure that out to, to see if, if caffeine is uh, not efficacious for me or even potentially ergolytic? Mm there was some evidence leaning in that direction. Uh, so that seems to be a concern that at least for now, I, I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it's generally uh, pretty good news, but then one lingering question would be, well, then why do some people seem to respond better than others to caffeine? So that question is now fully back on the table. Uh, but there has been some interesting chatter in the research about how relevant that variability actually is. Uh, and so one of the things that listeners can think about, which is an interesting question, is how do we determine if someone is a non-responder to caffeine? You know, I mean, it's it's going to have a small effect, even if you're a very positive responder. Uh, and of course, anything that we're measuring as an outcome it, we're not going to measure it perfectly. We, we cannot measure these things with 100% reliability. If you think of like, you know, what, what is the peak power I can generate during a cycling test? If you do it 10 different times, you're going to get 10 different numbers. Uh, and so one of the things that's interesting is people have been using very, very basic uh, criteria for saying this is a non-responder, that's a responder and drawing a line in the sample and saying everybody below this is, is a non-responder. And, uh, you know, for a really egregious example, uh, you know, you could think of doing a weight loss trial and say, yeah, so everybody who lost, uh, you know, more than zero pounds as a responder and everybody else is a non-responder. And you could say, wow, this weight loss intervention worked as long as you were a responder. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, even if you had a sample who, where everybody maintained their weight approximately, you never weigh the same thing two days in a row, right? So, all you're doing there is you're measuring the variability in the measurement from day to day and then drawing a line through it and said, well, these people had a great weight loss result. And it's like, no, they weighed 0. 0.6 pounds less because they just woke up with a little less water weight. <laughs> so there's been an interesting discussion in the literature that is currently unresolved about what is the best way to actually capture the, the, the true nature of being a responder or a non-responder. And Make sure that we're not chasing variability and treating it like a very real physiological effect. Now, I, I have no doubt that some people are going to respond better than others, and that could be said for almost any intervention. Uh, but, but in terms of determining the causes for that, I don't think we've really conclusively identified that yet.
Yeah. Now in the gym, I guess people are are starting to wonder like how could I know if I'm a responder or non-responder to caffeine supplementation? Uh, is there any like, you know, a heuristic for figuring it out or you just kind of supplement with it and you just hope that there's some sort of benefit, even if it's a, a incredibly small one, or does it even matter to the point of figuring out the size of the effect? If you have some sort of belief, you have a well-executed training program. And if there's something there, it will layer on top of that. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you can, uh, you know, placebo yourself into an effect, <laughs> it's still an effect. Yeah. Uh, especially with a low cost intervention, like, like caffeine, uh, you could buy a lifetime supply of caffeine for like 40 bucks. Uh, you know, or, you know, coffee is, is ubiquitous. It's, it's generally pretty affordable. Um, so, so there's that aspect of it, which is, you know, a lot of people are like, well, what if I'm just placeboing myself into thinking the caffeine works and that's causing me to have great workouts? Well, you had a great workout. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too worried about all the great workouts you're having. Uh, but you know, it, it can be tricky trying to figure that out. Um, you know, if you're a responder or not, one of the simple things is if you have caffeine, do you tend to have a great workout? If you miss it, do you tend to have a terrible workout? Mm. That, that's a pretty simple indicator. Getting a little bit more nuanced, uh, if you're someone who, when you have a lot of caffeine, you know, maybe you get jittery, maybe you get anxious, maybe you get headaches, maybe you have disrupted sleep. Uh, if that's the case, then I would tell you that the unfavorable effects you're getting from caffeine are probably at minimum counterbalancing any favorable effect that you're getting. So if, if if you consuming caffeine gets you this little tiny boost in your workouts, but it's impairing your sleep in the long run, that's a bad intervention. It's it, the sleep is worth more than the ergogenic effect of caffeine. So th those are the, the kind of basic uh, indicators that you can try to try to rely on. Yeah, and I think I cut you off there earlier. You had kind of a second point as to what we've been seeing with research that's com been coming out looking at caffeine. Maybe you could dive into that next point. Yes, I'll, I'll keep this one brief because there's not much to say. Uh, there have been two studies that came out recently that give us a glimpse at, you know, th there's two different questions with caffeine. One is, if I have caffeine today, how will it affect my workout today? Uh, but then the, a very different question is, if I have caffeine every day before my workouts, how will it affect my gains? And it's a very different question. Intuitively, we would think if something helps me get a better workout today, it'll probably help me tomorrow and the next day. And if I have a lot of good workouts in a row, I'm going to make better gains. Th that's kind of the intuitive uh, conclusion, but it's not always the case. And surprisingly, we really just don't have a lot of information about what caffeine does in the long term, how it actually affects training adaptations over time. The closest you can get is the pre-workout supplement research, but that's obviously confounded because the pre-workout contains like 35 other ergogenic ingredients that could affect uh, training adaptations. So there, there was one study that was specifically designed to address that question and they found a, some, some slight benefits leaning toward the regular use of caffeine before bench press workouts. It was a short study. There were very few subjects. The statistical results, if you interpreted them by the book, did not show significant differences between groups, but y you could see those patterns and those trends emerging. Uh, more recently, just this past month or so, there was a study looking at the potential interaction between creatine and caffeine. And indirectly, they, they did have a <clears throat> they did have a, a caffeine only group. So I was like, oh, well, this gives us a glimpse at that question as well. Uh, so the the people having caffeine only, this was one of those instances that even aside from the statistics, there was just nothing there. It, it was not helpful relative to the placebo. Uh, but this study was uh, very greatly impacted by COVID. And uh, I mean, the, the sample sizes, we're talking about five, six, seven people per group. Uh, and so the idea that you're going to find significant uh, patterns between groups with, you know, five people in this group and seven people in that group, pretty much off the table uh, with all the variability associated with the data uh, and no fault of the researchers whatsoever. Uh, but but COVID hit uh, kind of right toward the tail end of the study and uh, it, it, it had a pretty negative, uh, negative impact on the ability to complete the study. So uh 
that's pretty much where we're at. We, we don't know much about the, the consistent long-term effects of consuming caffeine, but I feel pretty comfortable saying uh, neutral to positive as long as your caffeine is not impairing your sleep. Because like I said, any caffeine intervention that's in, that's negatively impacting the quantity or the quality of your sleep, uh, you're losing more than you're gaining in that intervention for sure. And we did cover this topic pretty thoroughly, but just to rehash it slightly for newer listeners, is there some sort of uh, more useful scheduling of the caffeine intake versus a less useful or, or I guess, uh, more impactful uh, scheduling? So it's a, kind of a, a poor way to word the question, but can you ruin your sleep? Or are you more likely to ruin your sleep by scheduling caffeine at a certain time versus another time? Well, I certainly wouldn't have caffeine within six hours of bed, uh, and I still pretty certainly wouldn't have it within nine hours of bed. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I tried to, the best case scenario is getting as much separation as you can, honestly. Uh, we, we know that the half-life of caffeine is often estimated to be somewhere between five and eight hours. Uh, so it, it is in your system for a long time, especially if you have a really big dose and, uh, so yeah, I, I would try to separate it out as much as you possibly could. Uh, now in terms of exercise, one hour before exercise is, is the ideal timing. And, and so that creates quite a logistical issue for people who train in the late afternoon and evening. And I would, I would honestly say for those individuals that I would just take caffeine off the menu as a pre-workout supplement, honestly. Uh, mm. I, I, you know, if, if I'm, if I'm having my caffeine at 5 p.m. and I'm trying to get to bed at 10, uh, for a lot of people, that, that's not going to fly. Uh, so everybody's different. You might be able to get away with it, especially if you're a very uh, rapid metabolizer of caffeine. So I'm not, I'm not saying you can't go that route, but I would at least be cognizant of monitoring my sleep quality, perceived sleep quality. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's much more convenient to be a caffeine user if you train in the morning or the early afternoon. Yeah, I'm sure uh, plenty of people are going to be bummed to hear that. Uh, yeah, got kind of given the given most people's life schedule or work schedule. Um, and, and you talked about the study looking at caffeine and creatine consumption, uh, and, and if there was any issue. Uh, taking one with the other. It, you also said that kind of hard to draw any uh, conclusions from that given the small sample sizes, but is there any other research looking at creatine consumption with, with caffeine and if there's any like effect from taking them both uh, at the same time? There is, and it drives me crazy. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, let's see, pro probably four or five studies that you could say actually look at this question uh, where we've got, you know, creatine loading. And then during that loading for multiple days, there's high dose caffeine being ingested. Uh, so the type of design that would allow you to, to really look at that, uh, look at that effect. So um, yeah, there, there's like, I'd say five studies on it. Uh, the, the first two that came out were from the same lab and they're like, this looks bad. Uh, it looks like caffeine is really blunting the positive effects mm -hmm. of, of creatine loading. And then, uh, so those two were by the same group. And then Roger Harris, who's like a legend in the creatine world, he comes out and he says, well, let me see what I can do. And, and so he's, he's, I, I suspect thinking I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and debunk this. And he found the same damn thing, uh, it, which is, it, it's very weird because it, it seems like a fluke every time it happens, but it just keeps happening. And so we don't really understand fully what's going on there. Uh, you know, I, I hoped to, to take a closer look at this with a study I did as a grad student, but the problem was the, the creatine group didn't really do better than the placebo group. So then it's hard to say, well, what about the caffeine with creatine group? Did it block their ergogenic effect? You'd have to say, well, what ergogenic effect? Because the creatine for that protocol didn't work. Uh, and th that's what I was kind of getting at earlier when I said, like, when you plan out these tests, you got to hope to, you know, if you're trying to, 
know, it's not like you're always trying to make the ingredient look good. But if you're trying to get a nuanced look at when it works and when it doesn't, you have to make sure that your your training intervention is going to capture that ergogenic effect if that's the intention. So anyway, we did a study like that and it was hard to make good inferences. And then this new study comes out and again, it's hard to make good inferences for most of the outcomes. The creatine didn't outperform placebo, creatine only. And it was because you know, it was a very small sample size. They were dealing with a lot of crap related to COVID trying to get the study done. And so there was one outcome where creatine actually statistically, you know, had an effect that was significant. Uh, but again, the, the creatine with caffeine group certainly did not outperform the placebo. So you look through this body of research, you can find instances where uh, creatine works and creatine with caffeine doesn't. You could find instances where neither of them work but you can't really find a great study where you're like, oh, the creatine works, the caffeine did not impact that at all, and everything's good. Like, so it, it's a small body of research. I don't know if we can draw really definitive conclusions, but if there is an effect there, you know, it's basically going to be related to either opposing effects on muscle relaxation time. Uh, you know, uh, creatine tends to reduce muscle relaxation time. Caffeine taken for several days seems to increase it. The idea is that that might be an opposing uh, area where they're kind of contradicting each other. Another option is that creatine and caffeine together just upset your stomach. Uh, I, I know that that's what, uh, that, that's the conclusion that Roger Harris came to. Uh, he's forgotten more about creatine than I'll ever know. So uh, I, I think it's at least a, a credible uh, anecdote. And uh, so, so I think if you're worried about that, it might make sense to take your creatine and caffeine at separate times throughout the day, uh, especially if you have any GI upset related to combining them. But another thing to keep in mind is that most of the time these studies are looking at creatine loading with high dose caffeine. So we're talking about 20 grams a day of creatine with like five milligrams per kilogram of caffeine. These are really high doses of both. So I don't know how much that applies to somebody who's having, you know, five grams of creatine a day and a cup of coffee in the morning and they're separated by several hours. I, I just simply cannot give a really confident conclusion about that. But I'm at, I'm at the point where I think the, the kind of midway point where you're not catastrophizing about this potential, but you're at least acknowledging the research that is out there. I think is to just separate out those doses and make sure you're not having any GI discomfort at the time of training. Yeah. And I know creatine has been hashed out in plenty of other places, uh, articles, podcasts. Um, th there's a lot looking at it and discussing it. And I thought what we could do is one, introduce the supplement for these listeners specifically, and then kind of take the same approach that we did with caffeine, looking at things that have come out more recently, either showing different benefits or, um, you know, maybe things that didn't kind of pan out quite as well. So uh, maybe we can kind of briefly talk through what creatine is, what sort of kind of mechanism we're looking at and, and how it would increase performance and then recent findings looking at uh, creatine in, in different contexts. Yeah. So uh, creatine is something that our, our body makes endogenously. Uh, I think we make about a gram a day in most cases. Creatine is something we get from our diet if we eat uh, a lot of meat products, especially red meat. Uh, so, you know, typical omnivorous diet, you're going to consume like one to two grams a day of creatine, I think. Uh, but of course, we can also supplement with creatine. And creatine, we store it in our muscles. And what it does is it facilitates our ability to uh, create muscular force and, and, and you know, uh, continue, uh, sustaining high, high power, high force muscle actions during fatigue in really short term, high intensity situations. So basically we need ATP to fuel all of our muscular actions, uh, all of our cellular actions, you know, ATP, they call it the energy currency of the body. Uh, you know, we eat food for energy, but ultimately we break down that food to ATP. So uh, during really high intensity work, uh, we're, we're doing these, you know, really forceful, uh, you know, really frequent muscle actions that all require a ton of ATP. We can only turn fat or carbohydrate into ATP at a 
we can only do it so quickly. And so the phosphocreatine system is a beautiful thing. We've got this creatine stored in our muscles. Uh, you know, we've got with, with a, a phosphorus group, uh, you know, creatine phosphate, you know, there's a, the phosphate group attached to it. And when we're doing this high intensity activity and we need uh, to, to rapidly produce ATP, uh, you know, the creatine system helps us uh, go through that process very rapidly. So when we're doing really high intensity stuff, 10, 20, 30 seconds of really all out effort, the phosphocreatine system helps us create ATP very rapidly and continue recycling through it. So based on that mechanism, you know, when we start getting up to, you know, things that are a minute long, two minutes long, that's where we can rely more on carbohydrate to, to break down ATP rapidly enough via glycolysis, but, uh, or, or to create ATP rapidly enough. So based on that mechanism, creatine is great for high intensity stuff. Uh, when, when we're talking about, uh, people who are training for strength, power, hypertrophy, uh, you know, sets of whatever that last less than a minute, really explosive single, or, you know, a few reps here and there, these are areas where creatine can be really helpful. And what happens is we, we supplement with creatine, we saturate our muscle storage of it. Uh, cause that's the thing. Mo mo we all have creatine in our muscles, but most of us are not walking around with our creatine storage at a hundred percent of its potential. Most of us are walking around with it substantially lower than a hundred percent of its potential. So we consume this creatine via supplementation. We top off our, our creatine storage like a gas tank. And that way, when we are doing high intensity activity, uh, we can rely on that intramuscular creatine to help out. Now, some people do creatine loading. They might take five gram doses like four times a day for a week uh, to try to rapidly saturate their muscle storage. That's fine. Um, some people, I, I like to do a kind of semi loading period where I do two five gram doses, so 10 grams total. And I just do two a day for two weeks instead of doing four a day for one week. I, I think it's kind of a nice middle ground where within two weeks, you should be able to really saturate your muscles. Um, but four doses a day is kind of a pain in the ass. And a lot of people get uh, stomach discomfort when they do that. Uh, and then, of course, if you don't want to do a loading phase, if you just take like five grams a day and you do that for about a month, three or four weeks, your, your muscles are going to saturate within that time period. And then then you should be able to fully enjoy the benefits of, of creatine and like I said, uh, the, the most straightforward mechanism is that uh, creatine uh, basically reinforces that phosphocreatine energy system, supports high intensity efforts, uh, and, and that should be a really helpful thing whether you're trying to build power, strength, or build muscle, you know, achieve hypertrophy. Uh, there are also some other things creatine might do. Um, uh, there, there's a great review paper by Chilebeck and colleagues in 2017 where they looked at some of the other kind of mechanistic molecular stuff that might be affected by creatine. They looked at how it might affect myostatin and uh, sat satellite cell activation, how it might affect uh, IGF-1, how it might affect uh, reactive oxygen species or kind of have an antioxidant effect that, that could be positive for muscle growth. So uh, there's some other stuff it might do mechanistically that, that might facilitate its effects on hypertrophy, uh, which may then impact strength. But by far the most straightforward mechanism that we have good evidence uh, is is related to just uh, creating ATP rapidly. Yeah, and one thing I'd like to get your take on is when creatine enters the cell, it pulls in water, and there might be like some expansion of the cell, uh, which might cause you know uh, like some sort of like protein synthetic response. Is that significant enough to think about it all? Uh, it's possible. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it very well could be, uh, but, but that's something that I would put down into one of the more, more speculative kind of secondary or tertiary mechanisms by which creatine might have a positive impact. Uh, but, but absolutely it is, it is osmolytic when it gets pulled into the cell, it will draw water in with it. Uh, and that could either be positive or neutral in terms of its impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, for people listening who are, you know, maybe uh, on the fence about taking creatine just because they haven't been convinced enough to, to go out of their way to get it. Uh, when you walk into, say, a GNC or a vitamin shop, or in this case, you go on Amazon or some sort of store where you can buy creatine, they're probably 
um, aware of the plethora of options available and, and the different types of, of, of creatine, or at least like the different brands. And um, is there something they should specifically look for that is maybe a best bang for their buck? Or um, like, how should they approach the market of creatine supplementation? Yeah, Helms wrote a great article about this in Mass uh, a couple months ago. But, you know, we, we keep trying to, not we, the supplement industry keeps trying to find this next creatine, you know, this kind of perfect creatine. But it, it, we're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Uh, creatine monohydrate is cheap. It's safe. It's well studied. It very effectively uh, is absorbed and you, uh, you know, uh, taken into muscle. It, it, creatine monohydrate doesn't have any problems. It's fine. It, it sap, saturates muscles uh, very efficiently and in a very cost-effective way. So uh, I, I would say creatine monohydrate is fantastic. You might find a micronized version that uh, has a little bit better solubility. That's fine. Um, you know, that's good. Uh, and if you notice that you're having stomach discomfort from creatine monohydrate, I, I think it's pretty easy to just separate it out into smaller doses. So if taking five grams upsets your stomach, some people say, oh, maybe I need to take this version or that version. I would say just divide it into two and a half grams and, and take it twice a day. I, I think that's kind of the most straightforward way. And if, if you're having issues with solubility, just mix it into a hot beverage. Mm. And then with caffeine, we talked about kind of a, a heuristic or a way to know if it's having an effect. With creatine, is it something like a, a small change in weight uh, consistent over time that uh, lets you know you're kind of pulling in the creatine and, and pulling in water with it? Or um, is it kind of tracking workouts? Is there like a little way someone can know if they are a responder or non-responder to creatine? I would say tracking workouts and understanding the time course of creatine saturation. So, you know, if you're doing a loading phase the first week, it's not going to be doing much. But after that, you should be noticing stuff. If you're not doing a loading phase, it might take three or four weeks before you start to notice that extra top gear in the gym. And that's what you should be noticing. It, it should be there's that extra top gear where you used to fail at around 11 reps and now you get 13. That, that's what it should be doing. Um in terms of weight gain, like I, if you have a substantial increase in water weight, it could be because you've dramatically increased your intramuscular storage of, of creatine. Uh, but studies that have tried to use change in body weight as a very reliable predictor of whether or not you're a responder or a non-responder, it hasn't been that straightforward. It hasn't been that clear cut. Uh, a lot of times the placebo groups will gain some water weight uh, in these studies. And it's because they, they're taking four doses of placebo a day and they're drinking a ton of extra stuff, uh, you know, and so and, and water weight can be affected by so many things. And it's so variable from day to day that to treat it as a rock solid, reliable predictor requires a level of day-to-day -day reliability with it that probably isn't observed. So if you do gain a, you know, one, two, three pounds after uh, getting on creatine, that could be completely, absolutely due to water retention. But I, I shy away from telling people that it's a perfect indicator of whether they're a responder or a non-responder because there are so many other things that can affect the weight on the scale especially if you're not loading and we're talking about over the course of a month, you know, so are you going to really detect an extra pound of, of water weight gain over a month's time? It, it might be hard to tell. Uh, so, uh, that, that's one thing that makes it really difficult. Uh, and, and I do know some people have hesitancy to take creatine because they're worried about what if I'm a non-responder, uh, which, which is fair. Uh, but I will, I will say if you're consuming uh, just a basic creatine monohydrate product, it, it does tend to be pretty cost effective. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing is people worry about uh, some potential side effects. So, you know, a lot of people say that creatine is bad for your kidneys or your liver. They'll say it's bad for dehydration or cramping. They'll say that it causes hair loss. Uh, and, you know, it, it's not like it's not just that those ideas are unsubstantiated. It's that they're very soundly mm. 
disproven. Uh, you know, so, well, to varying extents. Uh, so when it comes to the kidney and liver stuff, um, if you have an underlying kidney or liver issue, then of course it'd be a good idea to talk to your physician uh, about whether or not any kind of supplement is good for you. You're, you're in a unique physiological state and therefore blanket recommendations related to safety may not apply to you, okay? But, but for someone with a healthy liver and healthy kidneys, there is no adverse effect uh, of creatine supplementation. Dehydration and cramping is funny because actually the opposite is probably true. As you mentioned, uh, we're, we're probably drawing a little bit of additional water into the cells. I don't think it's going to be, you know, a make or break thing that's going to make you permanently hydrated, but at the very least, it should have a negligible or potentially small positive effect on the hydration status of the cell. When it comes to hair loss, that's all based on one study. Uh, there was one study in rugby players where their DHT levels went up uh, in response to creatine loading. And DHT uh, definitely does have an effect where if you're ge uh, genetically predisposed to male pattern hair loss, DHT can drive the progression of your hair loss. Um, it, it's a metabolite of testosterone. And uh, the, the way that a lot of uh, a lot of drugs that aim to slow or prevent hair loss they do so by trying to reduce DHT or stop it from getting to its receptor. So there's a very clear link between DHT and the progression of male pattern hair loss. It's not causative. It's what if you're if you're already genetically predisposed, the DHT will progress that along. That's why a lot of times we see people going on anabolic steroids. Mm -hmm. They they rapidly uh, uh, kind of facilitate the process of losing their hair. But if you weren't going to lose it. Then, then you're not going to lose it just just from uh, you know taking anabolics or whatever. So um, so there's that one study there, but when you look at it, of course, anytime we're basing something on one study, we we have to have a huge degree of caution because sampling error happens. Sometimes we just observe a thing and we never observe it again, and we're like, what the hell happened there? Uh, it just happens. Uh, but another thing to keep in mind is they did not observe hair loss; they observed changes in DHT. Those are two different things. And then finally, when you look at the actual data in that study, the DHT change, it was basically like uh, in the placebo condition, they just had like pretty stable DHT levels, pretty normal. When, they, when the subjects underwent the creatine condition, their baseline DHT measurement was, was way lower for, for no real mm. explainable, clear reason. And so the increase that they had was it looked basically just like re regression to the mean, just kind of getting back to where it normally is. And, and at, at no point in the study was there, were there DHT levels outside of the normal range. It wasn't like some super physiological DHT value. So I'm not worried uh, as someone who's got a lot of baldness in my family. And I, you know, I wouldn't mind holding on to my hair for a while. Uh, I, I don't really lose any sleep over that connection between uh, between creatine and pr the prog progression of hair loss. But uh, it's something that I've always at least acknowledged in, in the interest of being transparent. But, you know, uh, before COVID, I was actually really stoked because I, I was able to facilitate. Uh, there was a supplement company that wanted to look into it. There was a researcher that I thought would be great for carrying out the study. Got them in touch. They, they got it all ready to go. They published on uh, clinicaltrials.gov the, the protocol they were going to use. Everything was ready to roll, and then COVID happened, lab shut down. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that that study will happen, but they're, they're going to look at this question a lot more rigorously just to give us uh, a, little more, a little more peace of mind for those who are worried about it. But I, I really don't expect that there's much to worry about there. Mm -hmm. And to kind of bring us up to speed on maybe studies that have been published within the last year or two, looking at creatine supplementation and maybe different effects. Um, do we see any changes in, uh, you know, uh, like cognitive ability or cognition or anything relating to something beyond strength and power performance? Yeah, I can tell you for sure that people are interested in looking at creatine's effects on a lot of other things, looking at cognitive ability, looking at, uh, uh, you know, depression or, or emotion related outcomes. So uh, more psychological rather than cognitive. 
looking at effects on bone. Uh, and there's even a meta-analysis looking at effects on fat mass, which really didn't, didn't find much. I haven't looked a ton into the other stuff, the stuff related to bones and cognitive effects and, and psychological effects. I haven't looked into a ton of it. I do know that you know there are some preliminary findings indicating that there are small positive effects on cognitive outcomes uh, and depression-related outcomes, particularly in people with low dietary creatine intakes. But um, that's an area of the literature that I, I really want to dive into very uh, in a very nuanced way because I remember at one point, th so this is kind of funny. So like with, with all the stuff we do, like you mentioned, I'm, I'm often doing like a thousand things at once, um, but I have to do everything I do very intentionally. Uh, you know, if I'm writing an article, it's got to be right. So there's some areas of research where I'm like, I'm going to look into that one day, but it ain't going to be today. So that's where I'm at with creatine and brain related stuff. But I do remember I looked at the one paper that people are always like, oh man, huge impact. It's good stuff. And I, I looked at the, the actual pattern and the means and I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like it looked like to me, um, the, the, the low creatine group or the group without creatine just got like way, way, way dumber <laughs> on there on their on their <laughs> test which of course makes no sense and so you know what was being often uh, presented as a positive cognitive effect of creatine was just not having an inexplicable negative cognitive impact uh, and of course I, the reason i make light of like getting dumber i mean it was just some little you know cognitive task and the score just went way down for no reason so it's it's not like anyone was actually <laughs> uh losing cognitive ability it's nothing like that I, I i certainly wouldn't make light of that um, but you know just some little test you know oh i did it in 30 seconds great but yeah i remember looking at literally one paper and saying someday i need to look into this a lot more rigorously uh, because this one paper is is not really doing it for me so i can tell you that a lot of people that i respect and trust do seem to be of the opinion that there are some small positive effects on bone and various brain related outcomes. But, uh, as I've not looked into them very skeptically yet, I just kind of put a little bit of caution with that. Yeah. And I think you mentioned it briefly, but you talked about people with varying degrees of creatine intake in their diet. So for someone who may be vegan or vegetarian, is this supplement, um, more or less useful and i guess it would kind of depend on the the nature of the diet but given that it's you know mostly absent of, of red meat uh, is this something that they should consider more than others i would say yes i, I would say that that's probably a good recommendation mm -hmm. okay cool and and we're going to start getting out of my minimal field of expertise even though it's not even that uh and, and start talking about some other supplements um, specifically one other that, uh, supplement that you did study citrulline. Um, and again, this is further out of my wheelhouse. And I think a lot of people might be less familiar with citrulline because it's not kind of toted as highly as creatine or, or, or caffeine. Um, so maybe we can kind of take the same approach where talk about why it would make sense to supplement with like what it does. And then we can go into actually supplementing with it if useful. Yeah. So citrulline, of course, is near and dear to my heart. Um, as I mentioned earlier, citrulline was one of the two ingredients I studied with my, uh, my dissertation study. And, you know, nitric oxide boosters are, they're fascinating. You know, they've, they've, they're one of those, uh, classes of supplements that right from the start, of the craze with pre-workouts, they were just front and center, you know? So everybody's talking about these pre-workouts and, oh, you're going to get these skin splitting pumps and, you know, it's just going to subjectively change your workout. And so everybody kind of decided right then and there, I want something to increase my pump, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure why, <laughs> you know, aside, aside from just feeling cool, uh, you know, a lot of that research there was just not not ready. We, we, we weren't really ready to say that by taking a nitric oxide booster and getting a better pump, 
you're going to tangibly improve your performance in the gym or improve your training adaptations over time. So that was an area I really wanted to look into as a researcher was something that had already been baked into the supplement industry and widely accepted by consumers, but we actually needed to figure out if, if that was the case. Um, now, one might wonder why I looked at citrulline and beetroot juice or nitrate, but I didn't look at arginine because uh, the first generation of pre-workouts all had arginine, various forms of arginine. Uh, so here's the deal with arginine. Arginine is the direct precursor to nitric oxide. The, the classical pathway of nitric oxide production, arginine gets converted to nitric oxide, and it truly is that simple. Uh, and nitric oxide synthase kind of helps that reaction along. So here's the problem. Uh, our gut tissues break down a substantial portion of the arginine that we consume uh, from either our diet or supplements. And so we might take an arginine dose hoping it's going to get into our bloodstream to produce all this nitric oxide during our workouts, but uh, it just doesn't work out that well. Arginine's bioavailability is pretty poor. Uh, and if we take really high doses to try to get around that issue, usually it upsets our stomach. So arginine is not an ideal nitric oxide uh, precursor. And of course, we can't supplement with nitric oxide itself because nitric oxide is a gas, which is inconvenient. Uh, and at the same time, even if we just were all, you know, puffing on nitric oxide canisters, uh, the issue is its half-life is extremely short. Uh, so even if we took nitric oxide itself within seconds, it would be turned into something else in the body. Um, and there's a lot of different directions it can go, but nitric oxide is not very stable. Uh, it's half-life is literally sometimes estimated as less than a second or sometimes a few seconds, depending, mm -hmm. depending on the physiological conditions in which it exists. Um, so anyway, citrulline is the precursor to arginine. So if we consume citrulline and get a bunch of citrulline into the bloodstream, then it'll convert to arginine and we don't have that issue of poor bioavailability. And so it, it gives us the opportunity to increase blood arginine levels and therefore create a bunch of nitric oxide when we need it during the workout itself. So that, that was one of the reasons I was really into citrulline instead of arginine. I also studied nitrate, which works through a completely independent pathway of nitric oxide production. We can get into that stuff later. So with citrulline, it, it was a really interesting, uh, you know, a, an interesting body of literature at the time I studied it. Cause there was this one study in 2010, uh, that, uh, th that, that showed a significant improvement of reps to failure. So they did like a classic bodybuilding, like magazine workout. It was like 16 sets of chest, you know, flies, incline, <laughs> flat, whatever you got. Uh, you know, so I, I love the protocol because it looked like it was straight out of a muscle magazine. But, uh, but anyway, citrulline malate allowed people to just complete, complete a few more reps before they reached failure, especially later in the workout when they were really getting fatigued. Uh, and so the, the most intuitive mechanism by which it was doing that was by increasing nitric oxide production. Nitric oxide, uh, of course can increase blood flow, but it can also, uh, it, it can impact muscle function directly. It, it can mainly, uh, in my opinion, impact, uh, I think the most, my opinion is that this is the most important mechanism, but the mechanism has been identified. I, I'm not just like speculating, but, um, it seems that by, by taking a nitric oxide booster and increasing nitric oxide, we can increase the amount of calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, and also make myofibrils more sensitive to that calcium release. And, and so that's ultimately what allows our muscles to create force. So the idea is that nitric oxide, sure, it's doing all this blood flow stuff and that's fine, but blood flow is not really something that is known as a limiter of resistance training performance, like maybe endurance cardiovascular type stuff, maybe, but mm -hmm. when it comes to nitric oxide and strength and power outcomes, I think affecting calcium handling in the sarcoplasmic reticulum is really the most interesting aspect of what it does. Uh, and so nitric oxide 
has been shown with a variety of different exercise interventions to, uh, of course, impact that calcium handling, impact um, rates of muscle fatigue, probably secondary to that by allowing it to continue creating high forces despite accumulated fatigue across a set or multiple sets. So, um, so there's this one study in 2010 that found that to be the case. Uh, there were a few studies shortly after that seemed to also find significant benefits. Then there were a few studies that didn't. And so a lot of people kind of followed the body of work, uh, in a temporal manner, kind of like a timeline. And they're like, oh, Centralene was working, but now it doesn't. But of course we, we have to look at that, um, body of literature in its entirety, you know, and, and, and not be susceptible to trends, you know, oh, the last three papers I've seen said it didn't work. So therefore it doesn't work. So in like 2020, I think, or 29, no, it couldn't have been 20, like 2018, maybe I did a, a, a meta analysis. COVID has fully distorted my perception of time. It, <laughs> sometime in the last 25 years, I did a, a meta analysis on citrulline <laughs> and, and looked at just the strength and power outcomes. And, and the, the outcome of that analysis indicated that citrulline um, whether it's citrulline alone or citrulline malate, uh, when dosed at you know reasonable dosages, it does seem to have a small but statistically significant favorable impact on strength and power performance. Now, the p-value for statistical significance, the, the, the cutoff we usually use is less than 0.05. And in this case, the, the result of the meta-analysis was very close to that threshold. And so I wouldn't be shocked if 25 more studies come out. This is, this is a young and very small body of literature. I wouldn't be stunned if more studies come out and the effect size shrinks from 0.2 down to like 0.15 and the p-value goes up and is no longer significant. It goes to 0.08 or whatever. Uh, but, but that doesn't really, you know, what we're really interested in is the estimate of the effect size. You know, so whether it's significant, non-significant in a meta-analysis, I don't particularly care uh, that much. I'm more interested in what is the size of the effect and do we have any confidence about that estimate? So as the research currently stands, it seems to have a small impact, but but not necessarily negligible. I, I think there's something to it. Yeah, for strength and power athletes who are... Uh, listening to this and then wondering, well, would it make sense to supplement with it given cost, given, uh, you know, I, I don't know, like the, the, the need to remember to take it, like what goes along with taking citrulline? Is it worth that small effect in your opinion? Um, so with something like creatine or caffeine, you can look at the cost, which tends to be quite low. You can look at the potential upside and say, yeah, th these make sense. Citrulline is in that next class of supplements where it really starts to depend, you know, so you can get citrulline malate from like any supplement wholesaler, you know, like, uh, you know, bulk supplements.com or whatever the case may be. And, uh, you can get it there for a pretty reasonable price. And one of the things that I like about citrulline malate, I, I get it in a two to one ratio. One of the great things about it is it tastes damn good. Okay. So th this might seem <laughs> ridiculous, but so if you're just sipping water throughout the day, uh, like I, I like to use like a water enhancer, you know, just something that tastes good. So like a little blue raspberry or fruit punch or whatever, just the little drops you put in water to make it taste good. You drink, you end up drinking more. Uh, dude, if you put in blue raspberry <laughs> flavor enhancer and you put in citrulline malate as well, Citrulline malate has this natural sourness to it. It is damn good. So I actually, my, my, my buddy is a dietitian, and he's really into lifting. Mm -hmm. He actually takes citrulline malate sometimes just for the fun of it, just because it tastes so damn good when you mix <laughs> it with something sweet. So uh, it's one of those things that like, when you consider the cost, uh, you consider the potential benefit, when you consider how pleasant the experience of taking it is. I, I, I personally, when I'm really getting serious about my training and I'm hitting it hard uh, and I'm doing stuff that that really focuses on strength endurance, 
So things where I'm fatiguing and I'm trying to crank out a few extra reps, that's when I feel like citrulline malate is worth it. When you're trying to make sure you're getting all all the gains out of your training and specifically you're doing stuff that really taxes strength endurance. Uh, if, if I were only doing stuff that was keeping me pretty far away from failure and uh, I wasn't really worried about my strength endurance, I, I probably would no longer see it as being worth it. And I think that's an important point because a lot of the the effect from these supplements is to allow you to do more reps, do more weight. But if you are not in touch with, uh, you know, high RPE sets or sets close to failure, uh, I, I just don't see it giving you the benefit because the adaptation is coming from the extra training reps, sets, volume. Um, now, in terms of dosage and timing with citrulline, say, say that was a convincing argument. It tastes great. Uh, I have some extra money to spend and I, I, I want to try it out and, and maybe take a few of my, uh, isolation exercises closer to failure, get a little more training volume in. What does that look like in terms of a day of consuming citrulline to enhance performance? Is it something that you have to do over time? Is it something that intra session you would do before the session? How does that pan out? So, uh, what, one thing I should say is, uh, you know, th there are instances, uh, in the literature of citrulline malate, improving performance on stuff that isn't close to failure, stuff that's just like maximal single bout type stuff. So I, I should at least acknowledge that, you know, higher peak power on a sprint test, what things like that. Um, but the reason I, I emphasize strength endurance is that's where you tend to see the biggest effect sizes and that's where you tend to see the most evidence. So uh, I should uh, catch myself there and acknowledge that, you know, th there is an evidentiary basis for saying, I'm just doing, you know, really explosive sets of two or three, I'm not going to failure. Can I benefit? Possibly. Uh, there's just not as much evidence in those particular areas. But, uh, you know, like I said, when we're talking about uh, things that uh, facilitate calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, things that facilitate higher sensitivity of myofibrils to calcium, uh, those very well could affect top end strength and power, even outside of fatiguing conditions. But we do see that the effects get bigger from citrulline under conditions of fatigue. So I, I want to make sure I was clear about that. Mm -hmm. Now with dosing, um, citrulline, uh, if you're taking just citrulline itself, you know, anywhere from four to six grams should be a sufficient dose. If you're taking a combination of citrulline and malate, I recommend a two to one combination, two parts citrulline, one part malate. And I recommend taking six to eight grams of that uh, in a single dose. Uh, in terms of timing, most of the literature available is on just a single dose taken about an hour before training. And we, we certainly do see that those acute effects, you know, it works in, in those acute settings. Um, with the nitrate literature, when we look at the nitrate literature, there is some evidence that prolonged use might be better than single dose or, or very few doses. Uh, and I wouldn't be shocked if that were also the case for citrulline, uh, but we just don't really have a ton of information to definitively say that's the case. Um, but like I said, I, I wouldn't be stunned to see that effects are a little bit better with continuous use versus just a single dose. Now, why is it, um, also, why does it also come with malate just out of curiosity? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I've, never, I've never really thought about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. that, that would be a great question for like Ben Esgro, uh, who's a, a supplement formulator. I'm not sure why they first got the uh, the inclination to to kind of put them together, especially because most of the time, you know, it's not like an actual formed salt. It's just like a bag of citrulline with some malate uh, sprinkled in there. So I, I don't know why they they first got onto that. But one of the reasons that I like recommending citrulline malate rather than citrulline itself, I don't think the malate's doing anything. I really don't. Uh, and I've talked to people who have looked into this literature. We can't figure out how malate might be doing anything beneficial. Um, 
I just think it tastes great. So the, the good tasting part is from the malate. <laughs> so, um, if you're just getting a raw material, if you're just going to go get a bag of citrulline in that case, I'd say go with the citrulline malate because the malate makes it a really, uh, nice tasting thing. If you're getting a pre-made formula, it doesn't, it truly doesn't matter. Whoever's doing the flavoring for it is going to make sure that they've got good flavoring going on. In that case, all you're really looking for is the citrulline. So the malate tends to be there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I just don't think it's doing anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I had planned to talk about more supplements and somehow we ended up talking about three over the course of an hour and 15 minutes. So I think that'll be a good place to wrap up and possibly continue with a part three at some point to talk about even maybe lesser known supplements or, or things that are commonly used. And, and again, to to discuss them in the same context of how they would work if they actually paint out that way and is it worth the cost um so so maybe we'll have to we'll have to schedule that in at some point but i mean given the the depth of the information here and the work that you do outside of podcasts specifically this one i mean the, the articles mass and the other content you produce i'm sure people are really interested in either signing up for that uh, the subscription to mass or following your work more closely, where can we direct them to keep up with that stuff? Yeah. If you want to stay in touch with me, uh, the website is stronger by Uh, it's a website I run with Greg knuckles, who's a very strong young man. <laughs> um, that's where you can also find the link to potentially check out mass and subscribe to that if you like it. Uh, and then for me personally, you can find me on Instagram. My handle is at Trexler Fitness. Um, and I will say, I, I do accept responsibility for us only covering three supplements. I do tend <laughs> to get a bit verbose, but just to pull things back full circle, I just have some advice for you as a host. When, when you've got a guest like me, who's just blabbering on and on, getting into the weeds, uh, and you feel that sense, that little discomfort, that level of discontent associated with impatience. I want you to just observe that feeling and just watch it like an object flowing down a stream. Just watch that, let it pass through. And that is my Buddhist wisdom that I'm imparting upon you. Uh, just a little bit of mindfulness. Don't become stressed by the impatience. Just let it go. Yeah. And, uh, people please check out the, their content, uh, check out mass and help support them. And, and the last thing before we, before we wrap up the show and, and say our goodbyes, what's next for Eric Trexler? What are you planning on doing? Uh, given the state of the world with the, the vaccine coming out and, uh, being taken up, you know, pretty readily and, and things possibly opening up sooner than later. And, possibility of more research being conducted, all of that stuff. What are your plans for the next six months, year looking forward? Uh, man, it's going to be crazy. So I've been, um, for a variety of reasons, I've been laying low and uh, haven't been doing any gym-based training. I've just been kind of making it work uh, with, with home-based stuff. And every now and then I train at, at Greg's home gym. So personally, I'm, I'm stoked to get back into the gym and, and really kind of crank up my training. Uh, professionally, we have a lot going on, man. We're actually, right now we're building a nutrition app where it's like a fully functional food tracker that is very convenient. It's sick. Um, but on top of that, it also gives you recommendations. You know, you set your body composition goal and it kind of coaches you, um, tells you, you know, how many calories, what macros to eat. So um, we're, we're building that app and that's going to take up a lot of my time and attention over the next several months. Uh, I have actually two book projects that I should be working on. Uh, and, uh, you know, between mass writing, you know, I chip away at them little by little, but uh, the book projects are going to be sick. Uh, so yeah, personally, professionally, there's just a ton going on over the next year. And then of course I am excited to, um, you know, getting back to normal is going to take time. Uh, you know, it's, it's not like there's going to be a single day where it's like, Hey, everything's back to how they, how things were. But <laughs> I, I am excited about the, uh, possibility of doing a little more travel. Uh, and by a little more, I mean any at all, <laughs> you know, for, for the last like 14 months, it's just been <laughs> off the table. But, you know, one of the things I really like to do is I, I like to go to these conferences and speak and, and kind of 
share updates about all the cool stuff that we've learned in the last year of reviewing research. And I, I love doing those conferences and hanging out with people and meeting people. And I haven't been able to do them for, for like a year. So uh, I actually do have one scheduled, I think in August. And so it, it's still one of those things where you, you kind of wait and see if it's really going to happen. But but definitely within the next year, I think we'll get back to a spot where at least some small amount of travel is going to be advisable and we can get back to meeting people who read our stuff and, and, and sharing some cool, some cool information. Yeah, that's great. And everything that Eric mentioned earlier about mass and uh, his account, Stronger by Science, all of those links will be down below in the description box. If you want to keep up with me, I don't know why I'm not very interesting. You can follow me on Instagram at Josh underscore Phil W-L. That's P-H-I-L-W-L. You can follow the Weightlifting Club at Clintonville Barbell, and we will catch you guys on another episode of the Philosophical Weightlifting Podcast.